Hey guys, what's up? Coach RT3 here, and today's Live with Coach RT3, we've got Paul Gray, creator of AFM and iFlows. So I'm just waiting for him to get on here, and we'll get rolling. All right? Hello! Hey, there he is. Do, do we pretend like that didn't happen before? Hello. Yeah, we're just going nice to pretend like... <laughs> We can just pretend like that last that last bit didn't happen. That was a, a little test. Make sure this uh, tablet <laughs> tablet communication to um, to iPhone will will work. I was telling people before that that they couldn't do it with an Android. Um, I was like, only Apple users can do this. This is this is. Uh, but you lie, dude. Um, yeah, <laughs> I was completely lying. Um, anyway. Um, it's really great to have you uh, join me here. This is the fifth week of doing these live chats, and um, I think they've been going pretty well. It's been pretty nice to just touch base with with every, people and both people I do know and people I don't know already. Um, and we've had some pretty we had some pretty awesome chats over in Norway. So um, I just wanted to give people an opportunity um, to get to know you a little bit and know more about. Uh, what you do, how you do it, um, and uh, on the tail end here, we'll talk about you know AFM because you know we've got that certification coming up in April. So, um, without further ado, everyone, this is Paul Gray over in the UK. That rhymed. <laughs> yeah. um, so, just go ahead, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, like. Where are you from? Uh, where you're at? How you got there? All right. Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a long road for me, and mostly a self taught road. Um, I'm not classically educated in fitness. I, I didn't come from the university background. It was more from the fact that. I've trained all my life and most of my life um, from quite an early age, but mostly in martial arts. So as, as you know, a big part of martial arts is about um, the conditioning side of it. So I'd, I'd always been physically active, but um, let's just say I'm not the most genetically, physically gifted guy on the planet. So I've, I, it was always hard. It was, I was never a, a natural athlete in any way, shape or form. So everything was a struggle for me. Um, but I found that I could, I could develop a reasonable level regardless. We'll, we'll put it that way. I, I was never going to be the best at anything, but I got probably better than maybe I had any right to be just by um, pure stupidity and stubbornness I think I think that's probably the the best ways to put it so it got to a point where I was training five to seven times a week and trying to work on on top of that so I was I was actually a bus driver one of my oh, first wow. jobs yeah that was I was I, um 18 when I passed my full kind of oh well, actually I think I might have even been 17 I think I might have been still 17 when I passed my full bus license, you know, and I was driving um, buses for four or five years. And I kind of hated it. <laughs> A lot of sitting, yeah? Uh, you know what? It wasn't even that. Um, you may not know this, but I'm antisocial and cantankerous. <laughs> and I just kind of hit it stopping to pick up people. I hated it so much. <laughs> You know, um, <laughs> I love driving the bus. You know, I would drive that thing anywhere. I just didn't like people on my bus, you know. And um, <laughs> one of those things, to, to be fair, it was it was kind of funny because with me being so young as well, um, back in those days when you got on the bus, there was just you sitting in a seat and there was no protection, there was no glass pane or whatever. And you'd kind of get that last bus out of um, Sunderland Town Centre or Newcastle or Durham Town Centre. And you got people that have been drinking for, for like two days straight to get on and it would just kick off, you know. Yeah. It, it, was, yeah. it was quite club on a bus, you know. It's like crazy. 
And a lot of the times I was a target because I'd either try and stop them doing it or just because I was there with, you know, a, a cash dispenser and a money bag. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we'd have a go at that and things like that, you know. So um, four years was was enough for me with that. Yeah. And at the time, you know, I was I was trying to do shifts, bus driving, and I was working, and those damn night shifts interfere with your martial arts training. And yeah. that was the that was the thing. That was the thing that really kind of was getting to me. I would be on a night shift, and I'd, I'd just be miserable. Because I knew all of my friends were training and having fun and uh, just drove yeah. me mental. So I ended up getting another job after that where I was a warehouseman. I drove mm-hmm. a forklift truck for about the three, four years. And still it was um, shifts and things like that. But I managed to wangle a position where I didn't do as many kind of late and I could kind of get finished by six, seven o'clock a lot of the time Mm -hmm. and I could just go straight training. So it wasn't as bad, but I got to a point where it was, you know, why don't I do this full time? Why, 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 why has that not occurred to me? Why I'm training all the time anyway. Why don't I I do it? And you know, that kind of strange, um, Hey, you know, the glamorous PT lifestyle. Yeah, <laughs> I could do that. You know, yes. you, get, you get to hang around and go, you know, jet set lifestyle, train on the beach. You know, yeah, <laughs> I didn't realize at the time how different it was. And yeah. I actually saw an ad in, in, a, in a newspaper for a, a, local, um, a local gym chain. And they were advertising for PTs and said, no experience necessary. Wow. I thought, that's, hello, that's, that'll do me. That's... Yeah, hello, I'll have, a, I'll have a go at that, yeah? Yeah. So I went along and there was probably like 20 children, you know, that all looked maybe 12 years old. Yeah. Just come out of university, strength and conditioning degrees and things like that. And um, there was me, and I, th- I think I was maybe 24, 25. So I kind of felt really old at, <laughs> at 24, <laughs> 25. I was like, Jesus, I'm an old man. They're never going to hire me. Um, but we had interviews. We had, you know, they took us around the gym. They asked us little questions about the machines. And they took us into a studio. And they gave us kind of five minutes to present something. And none of them could speak. All the kids mm. kind of just get dumb. Or the the they weren't used to the real world, and right. I'd actually coached and taught martial arts by this time mm-hmm. for a long time. You know, I I, I was up in front of people. I I kind of been on courses and coached for like two hundred people and things like that. So I just kind of went into uh, martial arts coach Paul, and you know, boom, through some of the warm ups we did and hit it with enthusiasm and they just kind of went, yeah, you're in, right? you're in, we'll, we'll start some training kind of in house and we'll see where it goes. And that's, that, that was my start. That was my kind of background. Wow. And uh, um, it was conventional gym, you know? Yeah, I think, I, well, most of us probably started in some sort of conventional space with full of machines and, and not enough room yep. to actually, uh, do anything besides sit on one of those machines. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're very comfortable when you you know you you're dusting the machine down and you kind of get under <laughs> this bit and you think I'll just I'll kind of have five minutes and then you know dust a bit more. You know? now, yeah, now that was a lot of a lot of time spent dusting kind of seated equipment and machines down. Um, <laughs> but it's funny that the the club was. Um, a club called Ivy Court, and there was three of them in the northeast. Mm-hmm. And the the guy that ran it, um, Charles Buchanan, I believe it was, was actually the guy that invented, or, or sorry, um, introduced aerobics to the UK. Mm-hmm. Actually, it wasn't down in London. It wasn't, you know, it was actually up north in Newcastle. And he was the first guy, I believe, to bring... Um, some of the BTS body pump systems over to the UK as well. So as far as kind of conventional gyms go, 
Charles was actually very, very forward thinking at the time. He, he was he was always over to America, seeing what the next thing was, and um, it, it was it was a big a big deal a big deal at the time. So for all yeah. it was no experience necessary. It was one of those places that in the north everybody looked to what um, Ivy Court was doing. You know, yeah. I think I believe that the Newcastle. Um, Jim was the main training centre for Newcastle United Football Club as well, so it had all the kind of, you know, the the prestige of the footballers training there and the pro players and um, Johnny Wilkinson used to go and train there and um, one of the other guys I believe was David Longstaff um, was at the Whitley Bay one and he he's an ice hockey player in the UK and mm. trained played in Sweden as well, so it, it was a it was a big deal at the time. It was kind of cool. So how did you, how did you manage to like, what was your transition like out of like that, that commercial gym, t- you know, space, um, you know, what, <laughs> where did you go? Where did you go from there? Like what pulled you away from, from that sort of, uh, environment? Well, I was, um, I was stupid and I overtrained and I destroyed myself. So, Yeah. So I'm very vocal now. People on Facebook know me. I'm very, very vocal about dumb shit and stupid training methods and people doing stupid things and what have you. And it, it's not because I'm um, any different. It's because I've been there and done it. So basically, I started uh, 24-25. I was at Ivy Court a few years. One of the gyms switched hands to Peak Fitness. So I was with Peak Fitness for a few years. I went to Springs, which was another chain. Then I went to uh, Bannatines, which was, you know, another chain. And by that time, I'd kind of been to so many different big commercial gyms. But on average, over that that time, I think I left. Let's get let's get this right. I left somewhere around about thirty two, thirty three. So I'd been there kind of eight years thereabouts, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I was teaching an average of forty plus classes a week. Um, so that's, that's you know, body pump, spinning, circuit classes, uh, body combat, um, Pilates, I was qualified in, taught that, just on, on the go all the time, 30 to 40 a week, that was average, um, then there was my PT clients, then there was my own training, then there was my, my art, martial arts training, which I still try to do at least five times a week. Wow. That's and that's yeah, a burnt lot. myself out. <laughs> yeah, I completely fried my nervous system. Um, I overtrained myself down to around about just over eight stone, eight and a half stone. So I, I'll put that in context for you, American guys. I am <laughs> ten and a half stone now. <laughs> yeah, I'm ten and a half stone. That is a hundred and forty-five poundish. 65 kilograms mm-hmm. yeah okay so i was two stone less than that and i'm thin now yeah yeah i'm slim i'm spelt now <laughs> so um i was ill i was absolutely ill i was eating my own body away um yeah. and i got the combination of overtraining to try and kind of look the perfect part um, the body image became more or less a, a, an eating disorder as well, where um, more along the lines where if I ate a bowl of rice and some chicken, I would have to get up within two or three minutes and start banging out push-ups, sit-ups, wow. things like that. Otherwise, I just couldn't settle. I was, I was kind of <sighs> just agitated and twitchy and, you know, I was like tweaking in a corner if I, if I, if I couldn't kind of burn that off and and do what I needed to do and the injuries were just stacking up you know knee operations and and just all kinds so wow I was chronically in pain all the time and I got to 30 30 thereabouts and um, I was just chronic back problems to the point I couldn't put my socks on on a morning, mm. I'd, I'd get up and I couldn't bend down to put my socks on. I was just crippled. 
And when I went into kind of the clubs, it was, am I going to do this kind of spin class and is it going to loosen stuff up? Or is my back going to go into spasm halfway through and I'm going to fall off the bike again? Right. And that's, that's wow. how it was. So wow. it was something's got to change to answer your question. It's a yeah. it's a long way around to get to the answer, but something had to change. And the real catalyst was I had the biggest and most uncomfortable, um, painful injury I ever had when I actually tore my psoas in half, oh. my hip flexor shredded, split. Oh, God. And Just thinking about that makes oh. me... I can't I've, I've, I've tolerated pain in my life a lot of pain because I do have a, a joint condition that gives me kind of rheumatoid pain uh, I've been punched in the head more times than I care to count I've, I've done stupid stuff but this was unlike anything else I've ever ever felt because it was internal yeah. and I was filming um, my second independent martial arts movie a film called The Solution with um, some friends of mine who were the director and the other stars and things. And um, I threw an axe kick and mm. it just went. And we thought it was my trousers. It just gone. Uh, <sighs> then I filmed for another eight, eight and a half hours. And I tore my TV. Yeah, Wait, we so... continue. Do so... <laughs> So you you felt this pain happen, yeah, and then yep. you said, "But I'm a, no pain, no gain. I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep." Plotting. We had limited filming time, and we borrowed a factory, a paper cutting factory that we didn't have access for again. Mm -hmm. um, it was a case of we've got we've got to do it. We got to do wow. it. Let's. So I filmed them. Um, Carried on, I tore my TVA. That was the second tear about two hours later. So actually, you know, my, my corset TVA split. And then I tore the attachment of my psoas at my lower lumbar off. At, at the lumbar was the third. Oh, man. I'm like, I'm, I'm having like You're sympathy pains. <laughs> You're gonna be a bear, be a grizzly. <laughs> hey, you. I mean, I I don't envy um, any of that it, at all. Um, it was awful. It was awful because um, it was probably I would say a seven out of ten painful at the time. Um, but the seven next day, it was at the time. Yeah, it was about seven okay. out of ten. Um, the next day. It was like a 20 out of 10, and it wow. stayed like that for about four months. And um, I got to a point where it was it was so painful, I couldn't sleep. I was kind of passing out, like just literally just... Um, and within 15 to 20 minutes, the pain would wake me up, and then I was awake for like 18 hours, 19 hours, until I would literally kind of flake out. And then the pain would wake me up again, what? you know? So, um, so you, I went. You, I went on like that for four months straight. So you without any any uh, medical attention at that point. Well, two weeks after I did it, I went to the doctors. One of our GPs. Um, he said you got to go to a physio. So I went to a physio. And I went into this physio, and again, it was a very kind of attractive, cute looking, like blonde girl who, you know, couldn't have been older than 17, maybe, you know, she looked about 17. And she kind of dragged me around this room and twisted my leg up my back and then pulled my knee across here. And I was screaming and I heard it tear again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh no 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 i i am not doing that again um i started to rehab myself at that point um 
bear in mind as well, I was still self-employed PT and I still ran classes for different places and I never, ever, ever missed a class. I could barely walk and I could barely get in and out the car, but I still taught my classes. Um, a lot of the time I would have to sit on a football and talk people through my classes, but I never missed a class. So, so after that four month period, uh, did you get any sort of surgical repair or did you? No, um, from what I understand, the psoas was ruptured long ways from the MRI. So it kind of split this way. Mm -hmm. So left that alone. The TVA split kind of, if you imagine the belt, long ways. Mm -hmm. So we left that alone. Um, the lumbar attachment was still attached, but just torn at the ligament. So they said there's not much they can do except right. wrap the muscle with hamstring. If they shave your hamstring and wrap the muscles. Or Great, so now you create you another injury, it. right? <laughs> well, again, you cut, you, you, you're cutting into things and I just... To be fair, I had lost a little bit of faith in, um, you know, the, the procedures as such. And I just thought, no, I'm going to try and do this myself. And if, yeah. if I'm not getting anywhere, then I'll look into it later. And um, I think for six to eight months, I was kind of walking, um, leaning forward, stooped over, kind of like mm -hmm. this angle. Yeah. And... Then after that, I started to be able to straighten up and walk without a limp, but I still on my left side, <laughs> you know, when you're walking upstairs, uh -huh. you know, you kind of do it, you, you do it up unconsciously. You see the stairs in front of you and you judge the height and then you just do, 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 do. I've still got to actively think left foot higher. Otherwise I clip the stair because there's huh. so much kind of damage on that side and like nervous system. So when my brain goes, okay, it's like eight inches, I've got to go 10 inches, 10 inches. <laughs> Otherwise my foot doesn't lift as high as the other one. So I have to actually kind of every set of stairs, I have to think about that left leg, lifting it higher than what I think the stair is. Otherwise I trip, I clip. Wow, that's it's ridiculous. That's so, pretty incredible. That's people, pretty incredible, well, actually. It's, it's stupid. It's stupid. And you know what it is? Um, when I tell kind of this story, people think about, oh, you did it doing an axe kick in a cool movie. The reason it tore on the axe kick is because I was doing 40 classes a week without right. compensating for the tightness that overtraining caused. It wasn't the kick that caused the problem. That was just the point at which it, at which it went. It was right. the overtraining and the muscular tension that was never being released, which is why you will see why I am absolutely passionate about you know the recovery work that we do and the water yeah. work that we do. And, and that's like really that. and, that's a really cool. Um, I mean, that's one story. Actually, you didn't you didn't share that in depth. Um, when I when I met you, actually, so I'm I'm for all the viewers, I'm hearing this for the first time as well. I, this, I was mesmerized every time you speak because you've just got one of those silky caramel voices. So <laughs> I, 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 I was just like, you hypnotized me, dude. So what you... I couldn't. I, I hypnotized you to the point where you where you couldn't get the story out. Uh, yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> But you know, I definitely think is is very is is very relevant. Um, I mean, juxtaposed to what you, what I learned uh, from you while in uh, Oslo, in Norway, um, hearing the story kind of puts even more context um, to uh, some of the things that that you you taught and you spoke of, and some of the things that I've carried with me from um, the AFM. Uh, certification and have begun to kind of look at as far as how I use my body on a regular basis and and how much I actually do with my body on a regular basis 
Um, and it, that leads me to like uh, one of the things you said the other day about being kind of like always prepared. You had an Instagram post. Um, I think you shared it on Facebook as well, uh, where, you know, it's kind of you've you've created this sort of training methodology so that you're always prepared for whatever um, you kind of need to to tackle at the moment. Um, to me, but you know, it, we you, we've got to define. You're right, but we've got to define what always prepared is. Prepared for what? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, you know me. You know me now. You've spoke to me in depth, kind of personally, and you know me. Nothing's arbitrary. Yeah. You know, um, I don't say you've got to always be prepared because it sounds cool. That's not right. who I am. I'm not guy. I don't say things just because it sounds cool and I don't do things because they look cool. That means nothing to me. So if we define to be prepared from my perspective, it's it's almost along the lines of we've also got to define what functional training is, what movement is, what what is it that I do or we do. And to me it's it's like that old analogy of, you know, the guys that can deadlift 500 pounds, but, you know, every time they try and scratch their back, their, like, lumbar goes into spasm and they can't get out of the chair, you know, that kind of, right. you know, we've seen it and we've, well, I've been there, I've been there too, you know, myself, as, as you now well know, and having to warm up for, for for an hour just to be able to do one deadlift and then, you know, you're crippled the next day is the exact opposite of being prepared. So me, um, you must think of that as having a general, a platform of general physical kind of preparedness that allows you to offset lifestyle, mm -hmm. which is icky these days. Um, my whole system of geometric tension is designed specifically from offsetting lifestyle and mm -hmm. it carries over the AFM too. You know, the principles kind of do interact and, and, and mesh. So the more in-depth I go with geometric tension in my own head and my own um, explorative training with my guys at my gym who are, uh, are basically guinea pigs. Really? That's... That's what they are. They, they beat the test all of my ideas. So um, the whole thing is primarily in its first three to four phases uh, about offsetting hidden lifestyle tension plus the tension created by our own brains and our own stresses and our own perceptions of our failings or how we don't look good or whatever and also the stresses of whatever habits and sports we do so you know we have stress from a lot of areas and it sits and lives in our tissue mm -hmm. you know and that's why my injuries occurred so that's also my focus on every bit of training I do every single bit of training it's not about developing strength developing performance um speed agility people see me now as being the flexibility guy and you know i'm not the flexibility guy i'm i'm pretty poor at that kind of thing especially with a gimpy leg right. <laughs> you know i've got a gimpy <laughs> leg man and, and, and i Going off tangent, I will come back. It's one thing I hate. It's one thing that gets me really riled up when people say, oh, it's easy for you. Oh, you make it look so easy. It's easy for you. I can't do that. It's like, dude, really? I can't walk upstairs with a gimpy leg, you know? <laughs> come on. Put the time in. Right. Put the damn time. But anyway, going back. So, yeah, it, it's, it's primarily not about achieving any excellence it's about being ready to be able to achieve excellence at any given time in any given area from this platform of complete readiness so you can do everything well you can do everything adequately right. whether it's mobility flexibility strength work endurance whatever you, you you have a an amazing platform 
and you can do it from cold. You don't need to spend 10 minutes warming up. You don't need to spend this. I'm not saying people shouldn't do warm-ups. Right. I'm saying that <laughs> if you need it your to. training... Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that your training should allow you to get to a level when you can just do to a certain level without needing to. Because if you need to warm up for an exercise and then compensate that exercise... I believe that that exercise is not necessarily healthy for you. All right. Because the warm-up and the compensation and the exercise should be built in where they do all of them at the same time. That's what I mean by be ready. I, so, I definitely... You know, there's... It's, it's, um, it's really interesting to like, um, have, uh, another, uh, verbal conversation with you, uh, as well, because, you know, I think like every time I've, I've spoken to you and, and kind of, there's only so much of it I can intake, right? I'm like a fiber optic <laughs> cable. You know, I've got a certain amount of bandwidth and there's, there's only so much you can squeeze <laughs> squeeze through it at one time. But you, you like literally... You like, you like to let you, it filter and drip and just kind of brew yeah. there. And then, I mean, I guess boom. that's why I like coffee so much because, you know, I just, you know, the whole filtering process of just, you know, getting that good stuff, that good stuff out of it. But yeah. it's like, I actually have to, sometimes I have, I have to go back and I have to be like, all right, this is how much I was able to absorb from Paul, but he sent me like this much. So I've got to like, let that stuff kind of sit there for a bit before I can start letting some of it come in through the, through the, the passageway. I mean, I felt like after AFM, for example, it was still like two weeks later and I was, and, and just little things were popping up things in my head. Dropping, like, right? yeah, like, Oh yeah, I remember like, Oh, okay. And to be, you know, with with all the things that I've learned and done and and practiced and absorbed from different people in different places, um, I honestly have to to say that um, the concepts and ideas that you know I just kind of scratched the surface of with AFM have bled so much into how I view everything that I do and all the training that I do for both myself, my clients, what, whoever I've, I've had a chance to confidently take a step away and take a step back and say, no, this, there, there has to be some adherence to these things before we move on and beyond that. And I'm at the point now where it's like, if you don't like that and if you don't want to be a part of that, then you, you can go find someone else that'll just throw you right there in with the, with the wolves, you know? So, um, but I'm not it that guy. Tough. It is tough because if you take on board what we're trying to do with the FM and myself with, you know, my um, coach PFG kind of education side of things as well, what, we're trying to do is to give people something that can last them a lifetime. And the problem is a lot of people want everything now and they don't see the future. You know, they only see till their next holiday or till this year I need to lose this weight or this year I need to be buff or this year I need to get that 32K bell up or, you know, they don't think, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line. And it's almost that like it's, it's, it's cooler to think, you know, I'm going to live fast, die young, slide <laughs> into a coffin, screaming that I've drunk hard and played hard and, you know, whatever. And that's great 
when you're 20, 30, maybe 35, you know, even some stupid people are still thinking like that when they get to 40. And it's great yeah. to have that kind of ego fueled exuberance. But the reality is when maybe you get to 40, get to five, you start thinking, well, oh, man, you know, maybe I should start thinking a little further ahead. It, it, it is what it is. And we can't, we can't sell the future to people that only want to think in the next six months yeah, you know, until, they're, until they're ready to start training and doing what they're doing now to make them better in five to 10 years time. And you can't sell that, but that's the way the system is. The system is a management system for longevity. Mm-hmm. It's not, designed to teach you how to use battle ropes. It's not designed to teach you five more fancy exercises that maybe you could have made up yourself or watched on YouTube anyway. Right. It's designed to give you a skeletal frame and structural management system that can overlap absolutely any training modality at all. Right. You know, you could, you could, you could go to Argentinian tango classes. And you could use AFM to structure how, which nights you train, which nights you're going to do your tango fast and loose, which nights you're going to work on skills, which nights you can actually use the element system for that too. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It doesn't matter. It's a coaching system designed to make you a better, more aware coach. Um, even though I only, when I, when I, when I kind of put pen to paper on it, I didn't, I didn't write everything I wanted to write for the coaching side of things. I mm-hmm. wanted to go into more verbal soft skills and um, actually the art of teaching and, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and learning styles and teaching styles and things like that as well. But, you know, we only have two, two and a half days to run. Yeah. So, so I, I, I dipped into it and I, I, um, I kept that side of it enough but not as much as i as i really wanted to um but yeah that that's what it's for it's it's a complete structured management system and going back to what you said about how you filter and and things were pinging later um i kind of get a feel for people quite quick in how they learn so Mm -hmm. i'm not really kind of I'm having a little chat to Rich and finding out the things he likes and this, that, and the other. But apart from that, I'm just taking a step back and actually watching how you interact with people and how you learn and how you, when I drop a little bit of information, are you nodding your head or is it just, you know, and then that can be a verbal piece of information or it can be a physical piece of information. Are you reacting to my touch or are you reacting to my verbal cue? And very quickly, a pattern exactly how you learn so i actually gave you information for the future because i figured out you know you're a you're a drip filter you're a coffee filter learner if we use that you know analogy so some people i didn't give as much information as i gave you um some people i gave the same amount of information as you and they got it straight away some people I gave only enough information that they could take before, you know, the top of their head blew off. <laughs> you, I gave enough to keep you going for a while when things would ping. Yeah. So, you know, that's it. it's difficult to try and do that within a course when you've got to deliver the same information, but certain certain words and certain verbal cues I notice resonate with different people. Yeah. So I kind of yeah, kind of like target that way when I, I come up to them and have a little whisper in the ear. You know what I mean? So that's why yeah, I, I I definitely learned a lot about um well, I think you you particularly with um uh body position so and, and kind of understanding um you know being aware of how I'm standing. Just something as simple as that, you know. I am it. keenly aware now of how I'm standing just when I'm training a client or, or just when I'm 
uh, talking to someone and I'm, I'm standing there now, I'm like, oh, what am I doing here? You know, am I, am I under control of this, this position? Or am I kind of just letting it all, <laughs> letting it all hang out? Um, it's strange defaults as well, isn't it? Those little kind of defaults you just drop back to that you don't even realize until they're pointed out. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. somebody kind of goes, why are you standing like that? Right. Am I? And that's what coaching's about, though. Coaching isn't just about do this squat, do this. Coaching's about do you realize in your lifestyle you sleep on your right side for like eight hours? You wonder why your right shoulder's bunched up. Right. That's that's more efficient coaching than any squat work. Yeah. Because if they nail that a little bit, then their neck's not going to hurt with that phantom right. pain that they don't know where it comes from. You know, so it's it's being aware enough to overlap those two modalities. Okay, we're going to do a squat, and when we do a squat, have you noticed that that shoulder pings up? That's the same shoulder that you lie asleep on all the time. Have you seen the correlation between when we're doing training and where it kicks in with the lifestyle? Yes. So your squat's going to get better if you sort out the lifestyle and your lifestyle's going to get better if you apply that down as we squat and we right. marry them together. And when we can pick these things out with a client – and they notice it always drop on one side or there's a certain way they tip or, you know, they kind of cross their arm a certain way. So this wrist's all kind of gummed up. And just these little things that then, you know, they catch themselves doing in daily life because we only may see them one, two, three hours a week or something like this. But they can self-check right. all the time because little, you know, Paul's whispering in their ear, you know, Shoulder, shoulder, shoulder. And it, it, it becomes, you know, they can't get away from me. It's insidious. Yeah. Yeah, that, that yeah. Then we that, do that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it is, though, you know, and, and you're, you're, you're right because it, you know, I hear so many coaches constantly saying, you know, my client's complaining about A, B, and C, you know, but I'm only with them for two hours a, a week. And you're not, you're with them all the and, time. Right. And so that's, that's, that's the take home from, from all of this, right? Like what, yeah. and it doesn't always have to be homework. Like everybody thinks about like, oh, assign them some homework to do while they're away. Like, no, they're not going to do that. They're not going to do it. You spend all this time factor developing this work. thing. They're not going to do it. Yeah. Factor their work into their training. Make it one. Be ready. All right. No warm up, no exercise, no compensation. It's all the same, but so is the certain things you put into their training, their exercises that are deliberately for them to offset their lifestyle problems. So it's the same all the time. You're just reinforcing the principle. And then you're just training. It sounds horrible. This is not disrespectful in any way. It's just an, an analogy. You're training them like dogs. Sit, stay, blah, 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 blah. You're just slowly doing a, a Darren Brown kind of mind trick on the, these people for their own benefit. So I'm very famous for shouting out random body parts and having stupid kind of, can you remember floor boobies? You know, stupid <sighs> Things that are just claw boobies, and then people put the hands in a certain position and work it, don't work it. That goes through their head when they catch themselves walking with you know lordotic posture and the butt sticking out, and you know they walk past a window and go, Oh, you work it, don't work it, work it, don't work it. pull that back in. Then you're coaching them every minute of every day, right. That's how and, we make a difference to the lives. And, and it goes all the way difference. into, it, it goes into like every aspect of the things that they do from, from getting onto the floor to getting up off of the floor to sitting down on their sofa to sitting at their chair at work. All of those movements kind of, they start to just happen. One of the things that, that um, happened for me with, with um, 
the work it don't twerk it i I actually didn't remember that but um because i do think you said it but uh, shocked when i when i go from uh let's just say like a child's pose position to a plank or as an animal flow they would call a loaded beast you know yeah. beast unload um so I'm going from that position to the other position, to the planked position. And what, I, what was really, really, like you said, that drip feed. One day I'm just doing, you know, this sort of movement and I'm recording it. And I come back and I look at the recording and I'm just analyzing the whole thing, just kind of saying, okay, is this what I want? Is this it? And I'm looking at it and I'm like, hey, what just happened there? And... I see that as I'm going from this position of of child's pose, right, which is a de-stressing, a spinal unloading yeah. position, unloading, you're, you're relaxed, you're, you know, in yoga, you're, t- you're relaxing child's pose. So I'm going from that position to this plank, and I notice my lumbar or my hips go poop like as I'm going out into that position, they're yeah. like, hmm, what's with that? And so I do it again, video it, and I say, well, what if I can be more aware of that moment of transition? Let me video this again. So I did it again, and oh, hell, did, did, did my abs really, really have to work? And I listened to the video, and I was like, um, Ah, oh, wow. Okay, I've I've maintained it now, right? And so after maintaining it, and and maintaining it to go back as well, I said, oh, there's something different here. So then now I, you I get set it. that aside, and I and I did uh, like a like a front step into that position. So I'm stepping now into like let's say a mountain climber sort of position. And what's happening again? My hips. And I used to get this yeah. in, in one side. I used to get yeah, this right? clunk yeah. every time I moved into that, that mountain climber position. Clunk, 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 clunk. Having reorganized and kind of taken this new kind of approach, that has slowly kind of dissipated and disappeared from a feeling. And I no longer am as consciously aware of it as I'm doing those movements because I've kind of just been doing them. Well, what you've, what you've actually been doing is training as an abs, lower spinal bore structural stability while doing loaded beast or mountain climber. What most people do is they do loaded beast and mountain climber as the point of the exercise. Right. The point of the exercise is to keep structural stability in your bleed points while doing any given exercise. So we flip the focus of the exercises on the structural bleed, not on what you do and, and where you go on and, and your movement because we all say that strength should be built on movement patterns, but movement patterns is built on structural foundation. Mm. And most people are blissfully unaware of structure. Right. Clunk, 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 clunk. I'm just doing it. They're just right. unaware until you feel it. It's pointed out to you. Somebody gives you a manageable, realistic way to get from a to B, to get from clunk, clunk to boom, ass and abs. And then you go, that's simple. Let's right. action it. And that's, that's how we train. And that's how you train for 10 years in the future because that shear on your lower lumbar, your SI joint, right. just locks in. You get it. And, That's it. Yeah. That's it. So and, the focus of your training is the stability, not the yeah. movement. The movement is built on the foundation. And that's completely, like, like you said, that's the approach now that I kind of take towards, towards all, of, 
all the things I do, swinging a mace, you know, my, my focus is stability. Um, not necessarily the mace or the movement, it's stability in those movements. And, you know, now the effort, the ease with the load of any particular given uh, mace has now changed dramatically just because I'm focused on um, stabilizing the things that need to be stable in order to do the actual activity itself, which is really cool. This is powerful. Us smaller guys, you know, not the, you know, the, the bigger kind of 200 pound guys can move actually proportionately quite a bit of weight, you know, proportion pound for pound body weight. Yeah. We're yeah. actually moving a lot of weight and we're moving it consistently and we're moving it with, you know, good technique, good form. And the reason is, is, you know, we either can't cheat it, me, with my uh, pathetic, weedy little body and all my injuries, I just can't <laughs> cheat it. I have to lock in my structure. I have no other choice. Or the likes of you, if you try cheat it for long enough, will break down. Yeah. These crumbs will become pain um, because, you know, we're, we're not huge guys. You know, we might have good musculature but we're just not big guys and proportionately those maces are heavy especially when you get them moving and you've got centrifugal and centipedal forces um it can be be very very heavy so we have to lock our structure in we can't cheat it we can't yeah so yeah. It, 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 the big guys should be doing the same thing by the way because then they would add a third on their weight straight away yeah. and they'd be lifting monstrous weights, weights. but you know we 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 can't cheat it so it's, yeah. it's all about structure structure is everything absolutely is everything and it's it, it's it's a prelude to movement and movement is a prelude to um endurance and endurance is a prelude to strength and then strength is dissipated by mobility so it's it's a cyclic Side twin cycle. All kind of fits in neatly together when you really uh, take a a good hard look at it. Um, so, I guess this, this is going to be kind of the last, I guess, question for you, and it's what? it's specifically I, 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 AFM. I got notes. I got notes. Oh man, notes. you got tons of notes. Uh, <laughs> 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 you got notes we didn't even touch on. We're going to have to have a part yeah. two of this. Yeah. Um, Go on. But What's your uh, question? just the, the last one uh, is um, about, like, it's, I guess it's, I'm going to join two questions together. Um, okay. Why, why should, why should um, American coaches, because this, this is an interesting point because you you said you said like and and i've having lived outside the u.s i kind of um experienced this people come to the u.s to get like what's going on and then take it elsewhere whereas you and pavel actually have something to deliver to the u.s i firmly believe that you have something to deliver to the u.s and not to say that this sort of thing has not happened before or that other people haven't brought stuff to the U.S. and whatnot, but why should American uh, coaches really uh, be very interested in, you know, AFM? And what, in, in your uh, mind, what do you hope to inspire through AFM for those uh, coaches here? I'm writing that down so I can refer back to it. Okay. Um, why AFM? Right. Back in the day um, when I was going through training systems, actually trying to learn and relearn how to train so that I wouldn't break myself and how to train in what, you know, the only word I had in my head at the time was I need to train functional so that I'm just not in pain. You know, I looked to the U.S. as a 
as everybody did and sometimes you know pretty much still does it, it, it you guys are most for the most part 20 years ahead of the uk and uh, or at least then you were some places you're kind of 10 years ahead now i would say the uk has kind of like come up a little bit but you're still ahead of us you're ahead of us in innovation definitely definitely innovation you guys have this is why most of my facebook kind of followers and people that support me and the vast majority of people i work with online are us based is because one um you're very innovative you anything that's new you guys are kind of like give me give me it i want to know um if it sucks i'll tell you if it's okay, I'm going to use it. I don't care where it comes from. Give me. You've got this kind of openness to new things. The UK traditionally isn't really that open. It tends to like to sit back, let everybody else test stuff, and then go, yeah, that seems to work. We'll, we'll, we'll have it now. You know <laughs> what I mean? And my brain doesn't work that way. I innovate. I forward think I push forward so over the past kind of 10 years I've bounced back and forwards training with a lot of like US coaches and some real kind of high quality people but also at the same time I'm thinking for myself and developing my own ideas so why AFM is because one for US coaches you guys are open to new ways to look at things in a non-critical manner um, and you have this real real cool ability to cherry pick what sits right for you so um, I know the material of AFM there will be something that pretty much everybody that goes on it will get something out of it's it's sectioned in such a way that you know part one will resonate with some people part three with others but everybody will probably get maybe two parts that resonate that they'll be able to find real useful right now um and because it's a management system and not a tool based system mm -hmm. it's clean so we're not trying to indoctrinate any trainer into thinking that this is the holy grail of training we're not indoctrinating a trainer into becoming a cash cow for afm or for myself or for pavel which a lot of systems do you know if you go into their system you were there to feed the people at the top of the pyramid with workshop money with recertification money and also selling their products and selling things like that that's one of the reasons we actually set up AFM um, was that we didn't do that. We've had that done to us and we didn't agree with it. We didn't want to do it. So when you join AFM, you join like-minded people that basically want to share information and create a platform that can be overlapped to any other system without interfering with that system. But you can take or leave what's in the system to suit yourself mm -hmm. and there's, there's nothing going to be bled from you apart from you know the cost that uh, of, of the weekend which you know we need to make a little money too but we've also got to pay for our flights and things like that so you know we've priced it down under the vast majority of us certs deliberately deliberately because we're going to put our money where our mouth is you know, this is not that expensive compared to, it's probably half price to a lot of comparative kind of certs within the functional or unconventional industry. It's probably half price, but it's not about the money. What we want is to give back to coaches that are busting their ass doing the 40 hour, you know, training sessions a week and doing this because we are that person.
still working for a living. So um, we want to give um, as much information back that they can actively use and still be able to do what they do right now mm -hmm. well. And just like you said, drip feed this management system so that they can actually do it better, do it more efficiently. And if, if that bit works and this bit doesn't, then that's cool. Throw that away. We're not going to get on your, your case if you don't use certain elements of it. <laughs> um, what you may find is two years down the line, it makes more sense. And you bring those bits back in or trial them. And that's when it comes to kind of like the periodization. A lot of people ask, how do you periodize, you know, the earth, the fire, the water? Right. And we've, how, many, how many answers did we give you on the course? We give you like four, five, six different answers. Right. Because it took you to make it fit the way that works for you. Yeah. And your clients. And the, the thing is, you can trial one way. And if that doesn't sit, trial the next way. You know, it, it's not doctrine. So that, so, I think, will sit very well with US people because they're free to create. To you, what would you like to see happen or what would you like to inspire through, through AFM is I think, the second part. I don't, think like, I don't think like that. I, I personally don't think like that. Um, for me, um, my job isn't to inspire people. My job is to give you guys that come on the course, the information to inspire your clients. For me, it's about information. For me, if you haven't got all of the information, you can't cherry pick the best bits that work to inspire your clients. And conversely, if I can give you a platform and some information on me and Pavel can give you the, the platform, the information, and we can get you guys where you understand that, okay, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this, and I'm going to try this with my guys, and I'm going to create, like Bruce Lee took, you know, Wing Chun as his platform, and he kind of molded it to Jikundo. That was his creation. That was his molding of the source material. That's what I want to do. And that inspiration comes from you guys in the creative process from the raw information. So it's up to you to inspire. My job is just to provide the raw information so that you can cherry pick and make it work for you. And you're free to do that. And, you know, that's what we hope to do. Sweet. Sweet. Um... All right, guys. Take it um, easy. Thank Have you. a great day. Have a great it. evening, Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.